10 years ago, you know, there was absolutely no engagement between the two. Um, and it's quite fascinating, given all of the human rights impacts we know related to drug laws. You know, whether that's things like the death penalty, whether that's, you know, right to health issues, you know, the spread of HIV infection, whether that's exploding prison populations. Hi, my name is Miz, and this is Promote the Hell Out of It the podcast where I talk to people worth promoting about subjects I think are worth talking about. And this is an episode I've been extremely excited to share with you all. I talk to Dr. Rick Lyons, Associate Professor of Criminology and Human Rights at Swansea University. Dr. Rick Lyons is a key figure in the emerging field of human rights and drug policy. He is known for his research on subjects including international drug control law, prisoners' rights, HIV and human rights, capital punishment and harm reduction. He also has a book out, Drug Control and Human Rights in International Law. And I am only scratching the surface. I found this conversation absolutely fascinating. As you can probably imagine, we cover a lot of ground. We talk about the history of drug control. We talk about how it contradicts a lot of human rights laws. We talk about what is being done and what is in future for international drug control, as well as a lot more. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation, and without any further ado, here it is. There was absolutely here it is. no engagement between the two. Um, and it's quite fascinating, given all of the human rights impacts we know related to drug laws. You know, whether that's things like the death penalty, whether that's... Thank you so much for talking to me, because uh, I know how valuable time is. No, thank you so much for asking me. It's great to be able to participate. I have a lot to ask you. And it, it is a bit difficult to know where to start because it's a subject that I want to make sure anyone can listen to this podcast and follow along with the conversation. The first thing I wanted to ask was, what drove you to be interested in this subject? Because it is extremely specific and uh, I'm really interested in knowing where it all started for you. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it's something that I talk about quite a lot as sort of an a warm up when I do <laughs> when I do presentations because um, I've spent probably the last twenty years or so, uh, at least, specializing in one way or another in issues related to drug laws and drug policy. Um, but the truth is that you know, on some level, I really don't have any real issue in drug laws and drug policy. Um, my interest in the topic and my my choosing to focus on the topic comes from my my work in other areas. I began my career um, and still am working in the area of prisoners' rights. Okay. Um, and I worked, I worked for many years specializing in issues of HIV in prison. Um, and when I was doing sort of frontline service work early on in my career in prisons, working with prisoners who were living with HIV and doing advocacy work for them, um, I realized pretty quickly that most of them were people who used drugs or people who had used drugs at various times in their lives. Yeah. Um, so that sort of compelled me immediately. I needed to begin learning about drug use. I needed to begin you know, learning about the laws and policies that were having an impact on the lives of the people that I was trying to advocate on behalf. Yeah, of course. And similarly, when I was working more broadly on prisoners' rights issues, um, we know the huge number of people incarcerated around the world uh, as a result of um, drug-related offenses. Yeah. Um, so again, it became very obvious to me that if I was someone who was interested in trying to um, advocate for the rights of prisoners, to advocate against prisons as a social response, um, you know, as a primary social response for the criminal justice system, um, that required that I grapple with and get to terms with understanding the impact of drug laws and drug policies on the expansion of the prison complexes in many, many parts of the world, including here in the UK. Um, yeah, so when I sort of boil it down, I tend to say, you know, the reason I do a lot of work on drug laws and drug policy isn't necessarily because I'm interested in drug policy, but it's because bad drug laws and bad drug policies have an incredibly negative effect on other issues that I do care deeply about. Again, whether that's prisoners' rights, whether that's HIV, whether that's racial justice. Um, and so therefore, you know, if you want to do effective work on those issues, it kind of compels you 
to have an analysis and an understanding and an appreciation of the impacts of drug laws and drug policies on all those issues. Absolutely. I think that's that's really important. And I think that the, the scars of how drug control has been enforced for so long uh, are easily seen to, to anyone who cares to take a look. But what I was really interested in was I started uh, reading the introduction uh, that you that you sent over to me before our conversation. And it was in the different stages that you mentioned of international drug control in what sparked everything off, because obviously we all think about drug control in terms of what we know from the media, what we know from our lifetimes or our parents. But could you maybe expand a little bit on on what the origin was? Sure. I mean, well, I think maybe just to start with the current day and to work uh, backwards, I suppose. I mean, the important thing, again, that sort of underpins all of my work on drug laws, I mean, the important thing to understand about drug control um, as, you know, whether it's an ideology or a, you know, a social or political project or whether it's a framework of laws, however you look at drug control as an objective, it has the objective consequence of legitimizing and strengthening the authority of the state, um, whether that's by creating um, frameworks of laws and policies and policing um, that obviously gives additional powers to the state, whether that creates a sort of an ideological rationale about the need to suppress drugs, which therefore justifies um, the increased state authority in all these areas. Um, and the rationalization in that regard is really key because we have to think that the idea of suppressing drugs, which is the language that was kind of used 100 years ago, opium suppression, um, you know, trying to eradicate um, the use of, of opium at the time. You know, that, you know, as kind of a social project or a political project, that creates a state justification for interest and engagement in some of the most kind of intimate and private parts of our lives. It creates a justification for the state to have an interest in what we do with our friends, you know. Uh, it gives them an interest in what we do in our own homes, in the privacy of our own homes. Um, and it creates a legitimate state interest even in kind of the most intimate decisions about what kind of intoxicants yeah. we choose to put into our own bodies, you know, whether that's for recreation, whether that's for pain relief, um, whether that's for socializing. Um, so drug control in the modern era, again, it's created this vast, um, as we understand it, framework of, of laws and criminal laws, particularly and agents to enforce those criminal laws, while also in parallel to that, creating this justification, this kind of moral and rationalization for why the states reach into those private areas of our lives is in some ways legitimate. And this, you know, kind of modern incarnation of it evolves really side by side. I mean, something that I wrote about in the book, if you look back at kind of the earliest period of what we would call international, you know, kind of drug control dating from sort of 1909 with the first meeting of the International Opium Commission in Shanghai, um, you know, you had people at that meeting talking, uh, you know, seriously talking about opium suppression as being the next major international collective humanitarian project following on from the abolition of slavery, you know, in the 1860s. Like seriously talking in those kinds of terms. Um, and and in, t in terms of that, hadn't it at, at a similar time been referred to as a economic commodity, which is, is quite polarizing to, to it being a humanitarian issue? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And that's been, again, sort of the, the push and pull of drug control from the very beginning, because, you know, drugs, whether that was opium, you know, kind of in the 19th century um, with, you know, the British government and British um, industrial interests having you know, colonial interests having monopoly control of opium production yeah. essentially um, and the British government even though it frowns frowned upon kind of the trade and the industry at the same time was reaping you know a large amount of revenue from that it was helping to fund the colonial expansion of the British Empire uh, 
in the 19th century, you know, large parts of that were helping, you know, were financed by the opium trade. Yeah. And by opium being produced in India, which was, of course, a British colony at the time and being sold, you know, sort of generally, illicitly, really, in, into China. And, of course, this prompted in the 19th century sort of two wars between Britain and China. You know, interestingly, at the time, you know, the basis of those wars that were launched by the British were to um, essentially to keep their markets open, yeah. was to safeguard their markets, because British traders, you know, were being were selling the opium into into China. Uh, the Chinese authorities, the Chinese emperor, sent troops in, um, seized the ships eventually, and you know, Britain went to war essentially to be compensated for that and to maintain their markets. Um, so it's a bit, you know. Again, the, might say the first drug war in history um, was a war from you know the West to maintain their <laughs> their their economic control of opium as a commodity. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, when we see the the getting back to the question you asked originally, I mean, one of the things that we see in the evolution of drug control over the last hundred years is again part of this rationalization and this ideological framework, which very much grows out. Of kind of the you know the temperance movement um, at at the beginning, um, you know the anti alcohol movement yes, in, yeah. in the U.S. for example, um, the idea that somehow intoxication is a moral sin or vice, it's equated yeah. yeah a moral vice related to sin, um, and we see that as a result, you know people who use drugs, and we still see this today, you know are sort of equated with being kind of chemical slaves. Yeah, um, and absolutely. deprived of all agency, deprived of all dignity, de- deprived of any capacity to reason or make rational decisions about their own lives. And therefore, the drug control, the state is essentially going to come in and rescue these people <laughs> yeah. and save these people. Uh, we still see that rhetoric today, even in, in some of the United Nations doctor, documents, this idea of chemical slavery, which is a bit, I mean, hideous, really, as a, as a concept. Yeah. Um, but because of that kind of growth a parallel growth of you know the increasingly punitive legal framework and the increasing use of criminal law as a main tool of drug suppression you know sort of from the 1960s onwards evolved hand in hand with this idea that you know suppressing drugs or eradicating drugs was some kind of humanitarian mission this joint humanitarian mission and that language is used explicitly if we look at the old um, sort of the old original international drug treaties, you know, sort of adopted, drafted and adopted during the League of Nations period in the 1920s. You know, they specifically refer to, you know, drug suppression as a humanitarian effort. And that's, you know, sort of useful on a couple of ways. Uh, you know, I said it does create this kind of like moral legitimacy of the state, as I was saying earlier, to, you know, reach into the private areas of people's lives and creates an interest of the state in what would otherwise be seen as private behavior. Um, but it also, you know, served a utilitarian purpose um, of, you know, keeping in mind that it's only really in the last, you know, 30 years of, of drugs, drug control, that, you know, drugs is being seen as this kind of multinational problem you know problem in inverted commas yeah. um but before that you had you know a small number of states who were really committed to the idea of opium suppression or cannabis suppression and lots of countries who didn't really have a particular vested interest in it at all um, but by framing you know drug suppression as this joint humanitarian mission of the international community you know it creates a way to get other countries who otherwise might not be interested in changing their domestic laws around drugs to somehow come on board with the anti-opium and the anti-drug campaign. Yeah, yeah, that's something I was really interested in because obviously in order for it to work, as many people, as many countries as possible need to be involved, but you need to push a sense of, of shared purpose for that to happen. Is that why we see the kind of language that has been used for so long, both in terms of referring to it as a humanitarian purpose, but also apocalyptic language provocative sort of analogies that are used yeah i mean i think it's a variety of things i think certainly early on and some of the you know some of the kind of the earlier writers talk about this quite specifically about you know framing it as this shared international cause as you said this shared mission you know actually had sort of a utilitarian purpose um and if there was one i can't remember the which who would actually wrote about this but they said you know the united nations sort of as the body to progress 
international drug control. They sort of said, well, you couldn't really have been as successful as you have been in progressing international drug control if it wasn't done under the auspices of what is seen as an altruistic, you know, multinational, yeah. you know, international community body like the UN. The fact that it's being done through there, the UN, of course, also being, you know, the home of promoting human rights and pushing forward human rights standards and economic standards and environmental standards, you know, the place where countries come together to address these big and important uh, human issues, yeah. you know, having drugs as part of that remit um, really gave it a sort of credibility and a sort of, you know, sort of moral strength that it might not otherwise have enjoyed, um, particularly early on. I mean, obviously the drug, um, sort of the illicit drug economy has changed uh, sort of very, very much. And, you know, many more countries now affected um either by you know drug trafficking or by drug related violence or by drug related health harms um, than there were you know maybe 40 or 50 years yeah. ago so uh, in many ways you could argue that's actually as a consequence of the current system rather than uh, the current system being a a response to that this is what I was going to ask when when you heighten this sense of fear against drugs has that had a, a direct impact on on what people are willing to do in order to, to catch drug offenders and how they're willing to treat them as well. Of course, you know, those of us in kind of the current era are all very familiar with, as you mentioned, the kind of apocalyptic language about drugs, you know, drugs being a threat to, you know, democracies and human dignity and, you know, the survival of people and the threat to children and a threat to families and this sort of thing, destabilizing force. We're very familiar with that uh, in the kind of current drug control discourse. Um, but it wasn't always like that. And I say one of the things I did in my own research was tracked the language of drugs primarily through the United Nations General Assembly. Um, say the General Assembly's adopted well over a hundred resolutions concerning drugs since you know the 1940s, um, and you can really see a pivot point in sort of the mid 1970s where all of a sudden the language changed. Where for the 30 years up to that point, drug control resolutions tended to be very dry and technical sorts of things. You know, they didn't really have you know any kind of you know, fiery language attached to them. Okay. Um, but again, you get into the 1970s, um, you see that pivot. Um, and say in the book, I can actually, I actually point to a specific resolution where all of a sudden you start to see this language. And it, it's very, very clear when you actually read, you know, when you read the, the resolutions chronologically from sort of 1946, 47, up until 1975 or whenever it was. And then you get into the kind of language that we're familiar with about drugs being this kind of existential threat yeah. to the global community. And again, as I said at the beginning, it's like keeping in mind that drug control as a body of law and as a an organizing principle for societies has the impact of legitimizing and strengthening the state. Um, you know, this would be a kind of language that governments, I think, would be very comfortable with by and large because it strengthens, and as you said, and strengthens and the rationalizations about why they should adopt more extreme laws, why they should hire, you know, more police, why you should get the military involved in policing operations, you know, why you should invade other countries or, you know, give military aid to other countries uh, under the, the auspices allegedly of fighting drugs, um, when in many times it's really just about you know, Western countries supporting their proxy state allies and in other parts of the world. So, I mean, drug control becomes a very convenient cover um, for a lot of these kinds of, you know, what are otherwise, again, utilitarian actions of the state to advance its own power, whether that's domestically or internationally. Um, and, you know, that's something we see still going on um, today. And I say in a lot of the, the negative in impacts that I think we see of of you know the war on drugs today is very much a consequence of that increasingly punitive criminalization militarized approach to to addressing drug use and drug markets yeah it's 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 really interesting how many people are hurt as a consequence as well 
I remember growing up and and listening to people talk about uh, addiction as as an evil that that was really horrific. But in order to combat that the amount of of other people that are hurt the amount of industries that were damaged as a result of of drug control like growers uh like people who especially in southeast asia when i traveled around there which before drug control made a lot of their income of those things was that ever thought about was that ever actually discussed as part of the treaty well i mean one of the things about i mean and there have been like lots of people who've written very good uh, very good investigations, historical investigations of this around the evolution of drug control is you can see the degree to which, you know, it's very much a demarcation between what would have been, you know, the colonial powers and the colonized states, yeah. col you know, colonized uh, parts of the world. Um, if for no other reason, by looking at what types of intoxicants were seen as being worthy of some kind of collective international response. So, you know, famously, you know, alcohol, you know, you know, the drug of choice of, you know, Europe, the drug of choice of the United States, you know, um, is not something that's subject to international control, <laughs> yeah. despite the fact if you're look if you're looking at, you know, health related harms, you know, interpersonal violence, all the things that we know. You know, for people who study criminology uh, or people who study public health, you know, the very many negative consequences related to alcohol use uh, and in many cases, much more severe kinds of public and health consequences than you get from many of the drugs that are actually yeah. criminalized. Um, you know, alcohol is famously not even talked about in the context of international drug control. Tobacco, <laughs> you know, nicotine, again, is famously not talked about in those con contexts. So, um, you know, and that's kind of carries through the entire history really of drug control and again it's not an area that i've specialized in but i read i read others who specialize in this is the degree to which you know the evolution of drug laws particularly you know in the last hundred years has been very much about defining others um so you know the drugs that we seek to prohibit and criminalize are not the drugs that you know we ourselves use and i say we you know the royal we as sort of the you know, the white economically secure politically privileged, <laughs> economically privileged classes in any countries, it's always the drugs that, you know, other people use, whether those are, you know, immigrant laborers, whether those are, you know, poorer people, working class people. Uh, and um, those are the drugs that are seen to be problems, of course. Know, whether that was, again, opium originally, um, or later, you know, cannabis and, and, and coca and cocaine uh, related um, derivatives, you know, those are the the intoxicants that are labeled uh, as the problems, um, which again kind of you know, shows very clearly where power rests. Um, and you know, we we obviously know that you know you know law is about power and who writes the laws <laughs> and how the laws are written very much tell you about you know who has the power in that relationship of, of drafting laws and that's as true in international law uh if you're looking at which states have you know power and influence in those things as it is you know in drafting domestic law i say but it's interesting i mean you mentioned the t you know the term the idea of drugs being evil um one of the things I've, I've written and spoken about quite a lot is in the very first United Nations drug treaty. We should say, you know, you mentioned the stages at the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, drug control law, international drug control law, which is what I, I, I study primarily, has evolved through a series of stages. So, uh, and I say I based this on, on kind of an earlier uh, interpretation from the 1920s by a, a U.S. Uh, legal academic named Quincy Wright. So talking about kind of the early, the first stage of drug control being that drug control of the, you know, the 18th and 19th centuries, you know, where drugs were, you know, a global commodity on the world stage, but it wasn't seen as something that was worthy of, you didn't have international treaties around drugs. Um, then the second stage would have been the early, what we call the early multilateral stage. So again, beginning in 1909 with the International Opium Commission, and then 1912 with the adoption of the first International Opium Convention. Um, the third stage, um, which Quincy Wright 
wrote about, which was the stage when he was living, um, he pegged at the beginning of the League of Nations. And the League of Nations did some very important things in terms of the evolution of international drug control. Primarily, what the League did was create what would become the international drug control apparatus. Um, so, you know, you created, we had like a political body to address drugs on the international stage. We had international expert bodies, um, you know, the control of drugs or, you know, the mandate to do drug control is actually one of the um, authorities given to the League of Nations in the covenant, in their foundation document, the, the equivalent of the, what would have been the UN Charter at the time. So the, we see drug control being elevated further into this international issue that countries were seen to collaborate on. And so my work, you know, building on that kind of structure is to talk about what I call the fourth stage, which is the United Nations period. Um, I said the interesting thing about the fourth stage, and, you know, there were treaties also negotiated and adopted during the League of Nations. Um, and of course, League of Nations falls apart during the Second World War, and the United Nations is built kind of out of the ashes yeah. of the Second World War. Um, and one of the first things the UN does in its very first General Assembly meeting um, is to seek to reassert international drug control, um, the international drug control regime. You know, so it was seen as a priority area um, for the for the UN um, from the very very beginning. Uh, and the first UN drug control treaty um, actually came out in 1961. It was adopted in 1961. And in the preamble of that treaty, which is the kind of the introductory section, which sets the tone for that, uh, for the rest of the document and how it's to be kind of interpreted, you know, it describes addiction to drugs as being evil. Um, again, which is something that stood out. And I remember when I first started doing work you know, kind of on the international law part of, of drugs, you know, 12 years ago, I imagine, I thought that was a really odd thing because, you know, evil does not, sound very strange. Yeah. You know, it, it, evil's not a term you're used to seeing in a legal document no. or a treaty. I say like evil is something, you know, maybe like in philosophy or yeah. art Catholic or Church. theology, you know, you might, yeah, you know, you see, you know, religious studies, you'd see, you might see discussions of evil. It's not something that you would typically see or it struck me as quite odd seeing that in an international legal Definitely. document, an international treaty. So I went about looking at other international treaties that have the objective of suppressing or eradicating other types of behaviors that the international community sees as abhorrent or unacce unacceptable, okay, yeah. you know, to see whether evil is a common term. And I went through, you know, most of the ones I could think of, you know, you know, so that, you know, the slavery convention of 1926 doesn't describe slavery as evil. The genocide convention doesn't describe genocide as evil. The apartheid convention doesn't describe apartheid as evil. The torture convention doesn't describe torture as evil. The non-proliferation treaty doesn't describe nuclear holocaust as evil. Um, but, you know, in terms of international law, drug addiction is evil. Um, so why this change? It's, you know, in some ways it's a bit, it's a bit of a, you know, a nice little comment to make in a speech, but it does have real implications because on the one hand, as I said, it gives you some flavor of that kind of moral, moralizing underpinning yeah, absolutely. Of, of the drug control treaties. But again, it also, the knock on effect of that is, well, if you're defining something as evil, you know, that creates, if you want it to, a justification for taking all kinds of extreme measures to combat that evil of course which is which is kind of the situation we find ourselves in today yeah and and this is where i find it starts to get really interesting we've talked about the united nations we've talked about the body that that deals with drug control there but they also deal there's another body that deals with with human rights right yeah absolutely yeah are they working collaboration are they working together um we, well that's an excellent question i mean certainly at the time I started doing this work, you know, in international law, I said for the first half of my career, my work on drugs was very much at sort of domestic level and whether that was providing services for people who use drugs or doing kind of national level advocacy in Canada or in Ireland where I was living on, on prison reform and, and criminal justice reform. When I started to basically went back to school mid-career to do international law, you know, 10 years ago, you know, there was absolutely no engagement between the two. 
Um, and it's quite fascinating given all of the human rights impacts we know related to drug laws. You know, whether that's things like the death penalty, whether that's, you know, right to health issues, you know, spread of HIV infection, whether that's exploding prison populations, yeah. you know, whether that's all kinds of, you know, police violence and abuse or mili- you know, use of military. There, there is and always has been a whole range of human rights violations that are integrally linked to drug enforcement. Um, but when I started doing work in international law and drugs, I say 10 or 12 years ago, there was basically no literature on that there was no there was nothing really in the scholarly literature yeah you know the human rights literature looking at drugs um you know the sort of the amnesty internationals didn't really have a position on drugs if you looked at united nations human rights bodies they really hadn't done anything thematically on drugs there might be a mention here or there of something linked to the death penalty um and it was to the point where there was sort of a, a very famous speech given by uh, Professor Paul Hunt, who was the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health at the time. Okay. So basically the UN expert on the right to health. This was in 2008, I think it was. He gave a speech at a big international conference um, where he was talking about his, home, his own work. And he would say how frustrating it was because he'd go to Geneva, which was the home of the UN human rights system, and you know, talk about human rights and that was fine. And then he'd go to Vienna, which was the home of the UN drug control system. And he said you could talk to the representatives of the same governments and they'd have completely different opinions on oh, no. drugs and human rights. <laughs> so his famous sort of phrase at the time was that, you know, it was time for the UN human rights system and drug control system to cease working in parallel universes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's been a big focus. And I think that's one of the areas, if we, if we tracked the development of, you know, human rights and drug control, which is what I actually specialize in, um, we have seen some significant progress over the last 10 years, um, and that progress has largely been driven by civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations who've taken up um, the issues related to drugs and human rights. Again, whether that's coming from, uh, you know, sort of a law enforcement perspective or a health perspective or, you know, the increasing presence of organizations of people who use drugs you know, taking the stage or organizations of small farmers and peasant farmers um, talking about their issues and the other economic livelihoods, you know, linked to producing, you know, small, small crops of, of, you know, of coca or, or opium. So there has been um, increasing success in this regard. Um, and we actually had quite a, a major milestone earlier this year um, when the we published international guidelines on human rights and drug control. Um, and this was a project that was a bit threat, a three year project that held expert meetings all over the world. It was a project driven by um, the UN development program and also uh, an organization that I'm affiliated with called the International Center on Human Rights and Drug Policy, yes. which is at the Human Rights Center at the University of Essex. Um, and I said we published the final guidelines um, just in March. Um, we recently had an expert meeting in Geneva sponsored by the High Commissioner for Human Rights um, to help us finalize um, sort of some additional commentaries um, to flesh out um, the guidelines. Um, but again, that's been sort of a, you know, a 10 year period moving from, you know, sort of the start of that process where there was basically no mention of, of human rights within drug control meetings, and there was really no mention of drugs within human rights meetings, um, to a point where we do see some engagement. Um, and certainly yeah. both of those systems now know that they have to take account of those issues. Um, again, the big challenge for those of us who work on these issues now is moving from, you know, we've succeeded in moving from silence, I suppose, to discourse. <laughs> but now the thing is to move from discourse to actual action and implementation. And that's obviously in most kind of human rights campaigns, that's always the big issue. It's easy for organizations and companies and governments to kind of say nice things uh, and change their language. But actually, you know, living up to what that new language implies is a much different exactly. uh, sort of struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm guessing brings up issues in itself because there's been so much pressure for for all these countries to get behind drug control 
that how much pressure will there be upon these countries to actually start making changes now? You know, that's a very, very good question. Um, and I think hopefully you know, the guidelines can provide at least some underlying framework for how those things might be done. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that, you know, you know, the vast majority of human rights abuses that happen as a result of drug control happen at national level. And again, we can go through the list, whether that's, you know, the death penalty, whether that's, you know, you know, racist policing and racist yeah. applications of laws or, you know, over incarceration and, you know, racial injustice in terms of incarceration for drug related offenses or HIV and overdose and other kinds of health related issues. You know, um, by, and load, by and large, all of those are actual issues of drug control as it's implemented in domestic levels, okay. which means to actually begin to resolve those, you know, surely, you know, international language and international standards has a role to play. Um, but with any kind of movement to change laws and promote human rights, the real heavy lifting of that is done at national level by affected populations, by advocates, by NGOs, by activists, you know, by sympathetic you know, experts and sympathetic politicians and sympathetic researchers. Um, but that's really the stage. And, you know, in some countries, you know, that's, you know, a bigger challenge than in others. Uh, and also, you know, the issues in different countries, you know, are very, very different. You know, if we look at, you know, the issues in Europe, for example, um, you know, primarily what would you know typically be called as consumer countries, um, who are facing, you know, crisis and overdose and this sort of other thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very different issues from looking at, you know, Latin America, which we typically, um, you know, there's overlap between all these categories, but would typically in drug control terms be categorized as producer countries, you know, and you have, you know, very serious, you know, issues related to not only violence from, you know, drug cartels for control of markets, but also violence from the state as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so very different issues. Um, if we look at Asia, of course, we have, you know, in some cases we have producer countries and c consumer countries, but also places where we have very punitive laws about drugs, you know, the predominance of, you know, sort of the use of the death penalty and other kinds of extreme punishments. You know, so in every country or region we're looking at, you know, the human rights issues are often very, very specific. Um, and of course, the ability to change them is you know, often, you know, dependent upon countries, um, the strength of civil society, the openness of those societies to actually be engaged, you know, for governments yeah. to actually be engaged by civil society. And a lot of countries, you know, civil society organizing is repressed, if not, you know, criminalized. Um, uh, places like Russia, for example, you know, where Absolutely. people can be prosecuted Absolutely. for advocating on that, for, for access to methadone, um, you know, to treat opiate dependency. Um, so, you know, very, very significant struggles. And I think, you know, one of the, the big areas where we're hopefully seeing now that those kind of silos about human rights and drugs have been breaking down is hopefully we can get more voices. Because for so many years, the only people talking about drug reform were, you know, the drug sector. Yeah. You know, yeah. or the harm reduction sector, which is a sector I work out of or used to work out of, which was, you know, harm reduction sector looking at you know, health care rights and health services for people who use drugs, which, you know, is a very typically a very, very small part of the HIV sector, which is in itself is not a huge sector. So, yeah. you know, the key part is now that hopefully drug issues have been legitimized as a, you know, a significant human rights topic. Hopefully that destigmatizes them to the degree that other allies can start to take up you know, those causes, people working in other areas, people working in, you know, people working more broadly in racial justice, people working more broadly in, in prison reform, people working more broadly in criminal justice reform or in, um, you know, anti-intervention or in, in climate, climate change and environment, you know, it legitimizes hopefully the impacts of drug control as more of a mainstream issue for, for other, other civil society actors, um, you know, other political people of political influence to engage with without being afraid of. Because um, I think that was because the rhetoric, as we've discussed earlier, against 
drug use and against drug traffickers and drug traffickers being this existential threat to the world community, you know, that had an impact on the willingness of people and other kind of human rights sectors to take up drugs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because the re- immediate responses would be, oh, you're just, you know, are you really defending these evil drug traffickers? And it's like, well, it's not about that. It's like... <laughs> There's, there's a, yeah. a bigger conversation at stake. Yeah, absolutely. And and how about the big change that we've seen in the last 10 years? I mean, I, I, you can't talk about drug control, at least in my circle of friends, without mentioning Portugal and decriminalization. Spain's decriminalized. Canada's changed their view on cannabis as well as South Africa. Has this changed the actual conversation in terms of, of the effects that this had on human rights is this being used as statistics well to the first part of your question it's absolutely changed the discussion i mean i think it's fair to say you know since again when i first started going to un drug control meetings say in the mid 2000s um, not only was there no discussion of human rights there was no discussion of any policy options other than piling on further you know, kind of the existing status quo approach of criminalization. You know, some debate around the edges about how we, you know, needed to provide more health services for people who use drugs. But, you know, there was no real fundamental discussion of any other policy options, which always struck me as sort of bizarre because, you know, if you talk about any other major area of public policy, you know, whether it be like taxation or healthcare or environment or housing or, you know, infrastructure, you know, foreign policy, you know, there's people who have very different views on what a government should be doing. But the fact that there were different views was accepted, you know, (laughs) Um, and, you know, the act, okay, we're going to talk about, you know, universal health care and some people support it and some people oppose it. And we just understand that people have different policy solutions to address big problems. Um, in drug control, that wasn't the case. It's like there was nobody talking about, you know, well, let's look about decriminalizing possession for personal use. Let's look about, you know, creating legally regulated markets for currently criminalized um, substances. That just wasn't even allowed in the room, which was sort of bizarre for a group of governments. What is, is there a reason? Why not? Um, again, I think there's, I think there's a, any number of reasons. I think, you know, from the, the side of the state, as I said, governments generally like drug control. Yeah, okay, <laughs> drug yeah, control fair enough. <laughs> provides them all kinds, of, all kinds of tools that they wouldn't <laughs> otherwise have. Um, and also, I just think the stigma against discussing anything other. I said the same with, you know, human rights organizations. I, say with the, I should say when I talk about human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch is, was the brave exception in that. And Human Rights Watch has okay. been doing amazing work on drugs and human rights, you know, for a long time. Um, but, you know, the mainstream human rights s- sector outside of that didn't want to talk about drugs because it was so stigmatizing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure that that was true for many governments who, you know, secretly, you know, might want that to take some kind of different path. Um, but again, it's in the last 10 years that has opened up to a large degree. I mean, we initially had a number of Latin American heads of state speaking very specifically about the direct links between drug prohibition and violence in their countries. Yeah. Um, and you know, high rates of homicide in their countries, high rates of militarization, and beginning to actually talk openly and advocate openly at the UN that we need something different for our countries because we can't continue to sustain this level of systemic violence in our countries. All of it driven basically by you know violence to control markets to sell drugs to the United States and Canada and Western Europe, basically, right? So, yeah, you know, yeah. they, would talk, they would talk very eloquently about, like, you know, people are being killed in our countries to provide, you know, products for the West. So that opened it up. And then, obviously, you know, countries such as Portugal, who decriminalized possession, all possession of all drugs for personal use, you know, opened the door. Um, the moves on cannabis by Uruguay, and then obviously the, the referenda in various U.S. states um, were very significant. And now Canada, um, you know, obviously a big country, my home country, yeah. moving to legalize cannabis. Again, that's all opened up the debates and to some degree is you know, kind of let the cat out of the bag because it's now again legitimized some of these discussions. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's still, you know, while I certainly, you know, support these moves towards, you know, well-regulated legal markets. And again, 
and there's other people who can talk about this with more expertise than I can, but we know legalizing markets in and of itself doesn't necessarily make for a good thing. You know, Absolutely, you can, you yeah. Know, legally, legally regulated markets can be done or they can be done poorly. They especially, can be done well yeah. Done poorly. Especially in you a know. capitalist society, yeah. And we only have to look at alcohol again for that. You know, we, yeah, we can have good alcohol policy or we can have bad alcohol policy yeah. and we can see, you know, the health and social benefits or harms of each. Um, but that said, you know, removing criminal laws in my mind is always a good thing because whatever, you know, to me, whatever social problem or health problem you're trying to deal with, you know, criminalizing people involved in it, you know, is always going to be a negative. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So we've seen these moves open up, uh, open up discussions. But again, it's as you open up these discussions, you know, it creates other questions. I mean, certainly in the United States, for example, um, when we see state level um, referenda that have legalized cannabis, you know, there's been an increasing uh, advocacy uh, from drug reformers, um, from you know, black community leaders and you know, racial justice leaders looking at, well, you know, what do we do with, you know, the you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who have criminal records as a result I mean, of yeah. using or selling cannabis? That's the thing. You know, things that are now completely legal. <laughs> So we need to, how do we go back and create a system where we can go back and expand? That's the thing. And the people who are still in prison. people who are still in prison. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And we know, and we know if we're talking about the, the United States, that there's huge racial disparity in, in how drug laws are, are, are prosecuted. Uh, so that means racial disparities in, you know, what's happening in terms of people with criminal records. And, you know, in some states, you know, that can affect whether you can vote. Uh, it certainly, certainly can affect whether you can actually get a license to grow cannabis legally in the new can legal yeah. cannabis markets. Um, so, I mean, that creates, again, highlights the issues of racial justice, which are, you know, integral to drug laws in, in, in many countries. Yeah. Um, it also gets to the question of, you know, you know, what some people could have called cannabis exceptionalism. It's like, okay, well, it's great if we move to a legally regulated market in cannabis, which is, you know, I think is a positive step. But, you know, what about other drugs that are actually much more dangerous that cause a lot more, you know, harm to people potentially who are using them? You know, you know the kind of drugs that are driving, you know, you know, pandemic levels of overdose in some countries, again, including Canada. Your Canadians are, are Canadian drug reformers and people who use drugs are some of the most um, vocal and, and articulate on this. You know, we have a massive overdose crisis in Canada. And it's great that, you know, we've moved to a legally regulated market in cannabis. But, you know, if we, we need to look at beyond that as well. If we really, you know, if we, if we recognize, you know, so if Canada recognizes, for example, that criminalization of cannabis use in cannabis markets has negative overall effects on, on a variety of other areas of health and social policy and criminal justice policy. Well, that's equally, or if, if not more true, for other types of drugs. So, so we, can't, we can't stop the conversation at cannabis. You know, cannabis has to be the opening of the door and not shutting the door behind. And I think it's really dangerous as well. The, the, the idea of legalization in the current climate we're in gives the power to, to big corporations to put so much money and marketing behind products um, and we've seen this done. We've seen the effects that had on tobacco. We've seen the effects that it has on alcohol. So it seems ridiculous for the next step to be that, the next step to be replicating what's been done and hasn't worked now on, on different drugs. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's something I think that is a challenge to some some areas of the drug reform movement, because, again, I don't want to harp on the United States um, because the United States gets too much talked about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's an interesting example of that, because if you look at the main anti marijuana lobby in the United States, you know, the, the main group that's, you know, lobbies against um, legalizing cannabis yeah. in various state referenda who have, you know, celebrities and politicians signed on and this and that. One of their most effective talking points is specifically the point you've just said, that we don't want to turn cannabis over to big corporations, to big tobacco, to big alcohol, you know, to big pharma and start selling it and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, that's actually a legitimate point, you know. Um, and in fairness, you know, some of the drug reform community has been very vocal in response saying, well, yeah, we're not pushing a pro-corporate you know, sure, libertarian exactly, yeah. model of, 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 of drug control. Um, 
but at or drug legalization um but at the same time you know again it's difficult because for so long there's been no discussion but the discussion a lot of the time seems to be revolving about around the economic difference that it can have on, on countries climates and and yet drug control was originally talked about as a humanitarian issue where is the humanity in in the effect it's going to have on people decriminalization seems like a way of actually at least not criminalizing people for what they're doing but still being able to look after them yeah i mean i think decriminalization is an incredibly important step and i think it's important for people listening to understand the difference between talking about decriminalization and legalization because they are they tend to get lumped in together but they're yeah. they're quite different uh, I say what we see in places like Portugal, for example, is, you know, drug markets are still illegal. So the, you know, the purchasing, you know, drug selling is still technically illegal. But if I'm an individual person who uses drugs, you know, I'm not going to be subject to a criminal charge if I have, you know, a personal amount of cannabis or heroin or cocaine or MDMA or whatever it might be. I'm not going to be prosecuted yeah. for having that. Um, so again, it decriminalizes the person on the on the consumer end, while the market itself still remains a criminal market, and with all the you know knock on negative effects that that results in, whether that's you know sort of crime or whether that's you know unclear content of whatever substances you might be taking or what they're mixed with or uh, or the, what quality they are. Um, but it's 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 incredibly important because you know, it decriminalizes individual people who who are incredibly vulnerable otherwise, you know, to being um, you know, subject to prosecution. Um, when we talk about legally regulated markets, what we're talking about is actually legalizing the entire, yeah. the entire market chain, basically, from you know, legalizing the production, legalizing the transport, legalizing the marketing and the sale and the retail side, and as well as the possession and use. Uh, so it's a much... It's a much bigger kind of, of process. And again, that's where you have, you know, the real risks of, you know, corporate interests coming in. Uh, and that's also where you get very different debates within the drug reform uh, kind of sector about models, because you do have some elements of the drug reform sector who are generally kind of, you know, more right wing libertarians yeah. who come at it from a personal liberty point of view. And the government shouldn't be getting involved in economic markets and markets will solve all the problems. Uh, and then you would have then you would have the more kind of, you know, you know, left end of the drug reform sector where I would certainly see myself, which is, you know, this you know, drug control is about social control. It's about, you know, it's about controlling what are seen as, you know, undesirable populations or vulnerable yeah. populations. And, you know, corporations can do that as well. And we want to try to move, you know, a drug policy that promotes health and human rights and social justice and racial justice exactly. and economic justice. That's what we want. We want to take away the bad parts of drug policy. I mean, uh, I used to say uh, uh, an old friend uh, named John Judge, who passed away a few years ago, who was a political researcher and speaker. Uh, and he said something to me years ago, which I thought was always very, very clever. He sort of said, well, you know, from his perspective, you know, the purpose of the criminal law was to create a framework in which none of us can live our lives without violating the law. <laughs> and then and then the state, based upon its own biases, its own race, racism, its own economic division, decides which of us to bust. <laughs> yeah. right? um, and that's, again, drug control to me was... You know, he said that to me before I sort of started working more formally in drug control. But I mean, drug control to me is the epitome of that when we see who gets targeted at the sharp end of the drug enforcement stick. Absolutely. You know, it's always people who are vulnerable for other reasons. Again, which gets back to my original interest and what drew me to looking at issues of drug laws and drug enforcement was because I could see that in my own work, yeah. you know. The, you know the, and the issues that I cared about, whether that was you know, anti-racism or prisoners' rights or pl prison abolition or, you know, anti-intervention politics, you, know, you could see the way that drugs were used to exacerbate those situations. Um, and so one of the ways you can begin to try to make a contribution um, in, within those broader movements is to try to look at the drug influence, the drug control influence, the drug enforcement influence in, in those situations. Yeah, well, it's nice because we've we've done a, a nice loop with the conversation and ended up right back where we started, which is always a uh, uh, is always great. Um, the thing I do want to to sort of end with is 
what what is the next step? We've highlighted the issues with both with legalization and decriminalization, but what is the next step in terms of, of this fifth stage? What what needs to happen next? Um, well, I mean, I think, unfortunately, as with, with any kind of social movement, you know, you make progress and you also have, you know, significant fallbacks. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that certainly I didn't predict, and I think most of us couldn't have predicted five years ago when we sort of saw some momentum in terms of opening up the discussion around drug policy reform, opening up the discussion around human rights uh, related to drug control, the rights of people who use drugs, the rights of people who produce drugs. Um, What we didn't see was the resurgence of anti-drug rhetoric as a mechanism for authoritarian yeah. Heads of state, yeah. um, for whether from people like Trump to Duterte to you know others yeah. around the world who are riding, you know, the anti-drug, you know, kind of rhetoric again, which had sort of died down to some degree, um, and again, obviously the most brutal and you know criminal kind of context that we see is what's going on in the Philippines, you know, with the mass mass murder of you know over 10,000 people by by the state uh, and state state actors in the name specifically of fighting drugs and suppressing drugs i mean that kind of just naked state criminality it's um, horrific yeah. is you know is not something i think any of us really would have predicted um, you know 5 or 6 years ago um, and then of course to also to have that replicated in, in other parts of the world to have that influence um, the kind of discourse uh, in, in other parts of the world, like, again, whether that's you know Donald Trump, um, or whether that's um, you know other other leaders in in Asia. Of course, uh, the Russian government has always used you know, anti drug stuff as a way to crack down um, on on political dissent. Um, so I mean, that's the real, um, I mean, like frightening thing at the moment. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which kind of brings it all back, you know, to. The difficulty of doing the work, and it's great. We can, we can make progress. As I said earlier, we can make progress in getting governments to say nice things about drugs and to recognize that drugs have a human rights context. Um, but when it comes to actually modifying government behavior and state behavior and 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 domestic laws, that's a very different thing. Um, and say in the degree to which you know anti-drug rhetoric in a really relatively short period of a small number of years. Has all of a sudden again been used as um, you know this rationalization for mass repression in different parts of the world. I mean, Donald Trump yeah. uses uses you know fighting drugs as one of his rationales for building his his, his wall that he wants to build. Ridiculous. You know? Yeah. So I mean, you can see that in that, and that's you know that's part of the difficulty, obviously, of of you know making political progress you know in any sort of social movement is it's always very it's always very fragile. Um, and particularly when you're taking on issues, again, which get back to, as I said earlier, you know, othering people, you know, separating people from one another based upon, you know, the kinds of substances they're presumed to be affiliated yeah. with. Um, it shows you that, you know, the really scary kind of power that that legacy of, of, of drug um, rhetoric still has, yeah. you know, even though you can look at it on the one hand and, you know think that you know that's kind of silly kind of over the top language but you know it does have an effect and it exists there for you know authoritarian leaders to obviously seize and use successfully um and again in in incredibly horrific ways uh, if we look at you know the philippines or what's happening you know uh, along the the southern border of the u.s so i mean that's the really frightening thing i think which is preoccupying many of us at the moment is how do you begin to deal with those uh those kinds of issues yeah i think that that is that is the problem is how individuals feel so helpless in the situation because it's left up to something completely out of their control which is is very bizarre is specifically growing up in what we consider a democracy that uh something like this is still seems completely out of people's of people's control in terms of what what could, what can possibly a, an individual on on their own level do to speed things along it doesn't seem like there's much that can be done yeah except that you know as i said it's it's an issue that cuts across you know many other areas of 
of social life and public life. Uh, and so from a response point of view, uh, obviously, mutual solidarity is important, not allowing ourselves to be isolated from one another um, by virtue of what we see as our our primary issues or the vulnerabilities of different communities. Um, but it is, you know, there's no magic recipe to, to, to any of this. It's, you know, say international drug control goes back, you know, over 100 years at this point in time. So it's not something that's going to be uh, remedied overnight. Um, and I say, sadly, what we're seeing at the moment in many parts of the world is a particularly uh, dark period in this. Um, and again, the the degree to which drugs uh, and the fight against drugs um, is used as a very um, simplistic yet effective tool by authoritarian leaders for, for you know, nefarious uh, purposes yeah absolutely well if nothing else at least podcasts like these also help encourage discussion about the subject and help people absolutely talk about absolutely. it absolutely um i've really really enjoyed talking to you rick it's been an absolute pleasure i've learned a lot so thank you so much oh thank you for inviting me i've really really enjoyed it and it's great to to have the space to talk about some of these issues they're they're incredibly important and and i'm super glad that we that we got together um, I will link to all your details below so people can can get hold of your book, can look up the course that you have at the university and can find out all about you. Ten years but thanks ago, again. Great. Thanks so much. There was absolutely no engagement between the two. Um, and it's quite fascinating given all of the... Thank you so much for listening to that episode of Promote the Hell Out of It. Please tell your friends if you enjoyed it, give us a like, subscribe, give us a follow, give us a review, depending on what podcast platform you are listening to. And another episode that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one is the one I recorded with Dr. Matt Lodder. He is also a professor at the University of Essex this time, and we talk about the history of tattoos. I found it absolutely fascinating. You Ten might too. Ago, Thanks for listening. You know, there was absolutely no engagement between the two. Um, and it's quite fascinating, given all of the human rights impacts we know related.